Welcome back to the Muzzle Blast podcast. This week, we've got something a little bit different. We're sitting down with author Tom Schiffer to discuss the history of the NMLRA book that was published a couple years ago. Tom's been working with the NMLRA for a long time as a Muzzle Blast writer. I grew up knowing him on the grounds as just being a generally cheery guy. Um, For me growing up, he always carried around a camera and in recent years has been a real asset to us in just knowing NMLRA history and having documentation and photographs of all this stuff. So this is a a different episode. I mean, it's not talking about guns or hunting, but it's, it's talking about some of Tom's personal history in muzzleloading and black powder, as well as a lot of really interesting anecdotes about the beginnings of the National Muzzleloading Rifle Association that I personally hadn't heard before. You'll notice in the background through this, there's actually some gunshots. We recorded this during the September 2019 National Championships, and they were running some evening relays on the trap range, and it just wasn't something that I could take out. So thanks for listening, and I'll catch you at the end of the show. Well, done two books with this thing. (laughs) It does great. Well, you saw my book. You saw most of the photographs. You came right through one of these. Now, this is my... About my sixth one of a G12. Really? Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't have it two days and dropped it <laughs> and went back to the to the dealer. Uh, it was Best Buy. Uh-huh. And they said, um, did you buy the, the, the guarantee? And I said, no. And he says, you buy it right now and I'll replace it. He says, go. go back there and get a new one. So that was my second one. And then I I think I dropped it. When I sent it away, when they sent it away, they lost it. And they didn't give me another one, but they gave me the um, the price of it, which was substantial. And uh, I bought another one. And I don't remember what happened to that one, but you know, on and on. So have you always carried a camera down here? No. No? What made you start? This. Digital camera. Fit in your pocket. I used to have a little... The damnedest thing I ever saw. I mean, (laughs) you know, if I want to buy something for the trailer, I go over there and take a picture of uh, of, of the builder's plate. And uh, then you just, you know, you you go in there and I have, I think I counted up last night. I've taken 350 pictures as of last night with this, at this shoot. Yeah, that's great. And how many will you use? Maybe a dozen, maybe. I was a a Pentax man, and then I was a Nikon man, uh, but they wouldn't fit in your pocket. But I I carried that Pentax like a purse uh, down here, too. I've been coming here from either 1954 or 1955, and when I first came here, that stone restroom behind you was the uh, the only sanitation facility on the grounds, and the only other building was the clubhouse itself. Uh, those were the two buildings here. There was no commercial activity. There was no covered firing line that you have right there. Uh, that uh, didn't come until uh, 1959. But at any rate, uh, the number of people who were here when I first came uh, were the older generation, which I am now of this organization, uh, of the beginners of the association. Red Ferris, uh, Bull Ramsey, the Boss Johnsons. Uh, and all of these people were genuine characters. They were amateurs when it came to publications. 
They were amateurs when it came to uh, running a volunteer organization, but they wanted to do it and they did do it. They are a very real creature of the Great Depression. When I got into muzzleloading, powder was 89 cents a pound. Lead you would bum from a plumber somewhere and some cloth uh, for some patching. And uh, I just about defy you to write, uh, to uh, shoot up a dollar's worth of ammunition in an afternoon. Uh, of course, a dollar was a dollar in those days. And, uh, uh, a lot more money than it is now. But at any rate, I decided that the organization uh, needed a history, and uh, you could say we, uh, we sold the idea to the board of directors, and uh, I got a contract and uh, wrote the book, and it's been out since uh, the fall of 2017. I have adopted Merrill P. Deer's admonition right here on the cover. Don't let the shooting get in the way of the fun. And that is, that's my bottom line here. And I think whenever we diminish the ability to have self-expression down here and inhibit it, inhibit it, the characters who uh, naturally came out of the out of the woods, if you will, back in the old days. Uh, it was wonderful. Uh, it really was. I could say that uh, some of the revelry on these grounds uh, maybe got a little toward the edge of propriety, but it's uh, uh, become a very family-oriented organization. And I can say that my two kids were raised on these grounds and many others were. And Ethan, I dare say you were. But uh, at any rate, and your father for that matter. <laughs> So if you, uh, do you have some questions about uh, the writing of the book? Or... Was it difficult to find this information or did you have to dig or pretty decent records kept? What, what, what did that process look like? Was the archives or, or was it more interviews? The answer to that is yes and no. It, there was a, a rich trove of information haphazardly kept from the early days. As a matter of fact, I never found the minutes of the meeting uh, before about 1947. Uh, the, a, a primary source was muzzle blast. And of course, that didn't come in until 1939. But Red Ferris wrote uh, a friendly letter after each shoot, and before each shoot, actually, telling you where it was going to be and what it was going to be. And after it was over, he would send you another, uh, listing the scores and telling you uh, what it was like. And I would say I have probably found and read 70% of those. The other thing that was a, uh, a veritable treasure trove is coming here since 1954 or 1955 and, and meeting these people and knowing these people, unfortunately, I didn't know Boss Johnson. I knew Red Ferris. I did not know Bull Ramsey. Uh, some of these people, they don't know that I didn't know you could talk to the president of this association, that he would, uh, would give you the time of day. And 
the opposite was actually true, but I didn't know that. And I figured having seen some of the uh, fun that was done on these grounds, and I have put a lot of it in this book, uh, and it's just a treasure trove. In a sense, these people wrote the book. I just copied it down, so to speak, and, uh, and made it into a, a presentable form. But uh, if you get the book, I think you'll agree with me that they were some real characters. Uh, I, I would say that Bull Ramsey was, in his day, was uh, the heart of this association. Uh, uh, he ran the Last Chance Hotel, which was a... Uh, bunch of scantlings thrown together with canvas over the top and uh, his wife Pearl had a, uh, a big pot of beans on and anybody who didn't have a place to stay was, was welcome to throw a bedroll on the ground and uh, uh, dig into the bean pot. If you were foolish enough to sign the guest register, uh, after the shoot was over, you were likely to get a bill saying that uh, your horse ate the mattress and uh, you had stolen some silverware off the table or the missing doorknobs, uh, on and on. And uh, if you were really lucky, John Borsotti, who was, was one of his... Uh, innkeeper friends, you might say, uh, he, would, he would get up a uh, caricature of yourself uh, as a wanted poster. And uh, I have seen these caricatures at people's funerals. And there was one of them at Merrill P. Deer's funeral, I can remember specifically. But uh, it, it was, it was kind of an honor to be pilloried by this book. So what, um, what years does this cover this, for the association? Okay, the, cover, the, the association uh, originated in Portsmouth, Ohio in 1933. And there was a, another organization, unrelated. WLW Cincinnati that had a shoot at this schoolhouse right up here in town uh, in that same year. Bull Ramsey attended that shoot and he was one of the Portsmouth people and he came back and uh, told Red Ferris about it. They got together and then they shot at Rising Sun, Indiana right on the river. And I can remember talking to some old timers and they didn't like shooting there because you, if a steamboat came along, you had to quit shooting until it got, at, got past. Uh, Bull Ramsey's capers at that, uh, on that occasion attracted a lot of attention. And in the 1937 flood, that place was literally destroyed as far as being able to hold a shoot there. So in 1937, they went to Dillsboro, Indiana. From Dillsboro, Indiana, two years, they came to the Sugar Bowl, which is the geography directly behind me in this picture. Uh, it is where the, uh, it is a huge bowl-shaped uh, valley, and they shot there parallel to Route 62. Later on, they came to where we are standing right now, and they were the guests of uh, Wilkie Lemon. And Wilkie Lemon owned this farm, and he, then the next year sold this part of the farm to 
NMLRA. And later on, we bought adjacent pieces until we now have, what, 548 acres? Well, I'm just uh, amazed at it. And uh, maybe the next time you see me, I'll have one of them in my pocket. <laughs> it's a little bit smaller. <laughs> my oldest boy is uh, about 50. Well, he is 50. And he does reenactment, World War II. Okay. And he said, Dad, you need to, you need to uh, go with me one time. I'll get you a uniform. Well, I couldn't find a uniform that would fit me. You know, a little Labrador boy. And uh, at any rate, uh, we came up with the idea of me dressing as a. Uh, the mad photographer, the press man. So okay. I got an old slouch hat with a sign that said press. And I got a racing horn and put in one pocket, and I got a bottle of gin and put in the other pocket, and a, and a big uh, large uh, format camera. What the hell? It was uh, a uh, you know one of the old cameras. Uh, Oh, geez, you know, the old press cameras. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, yeah. Bellows on it. Well, it had bellows and it had the, you know, the big uh, flash. flash. So <laughs> I took and, and, and screwed with a quarter 20 platform on the bottom and put this thing on it. And nobody ever noticed it. <laughs> and I went around, I'm really taking pictures with the thing. And That's awesome. I had a ball, you know. And there were more people taking pictures of me than they were taking pictures of these Germans in a in a in a BMW with a sidecar and an MG42 on the sidecar. I don't know if you've ever been to one of those reenactments, but not. they are something to see. I have not. I uh, I would kind of like to. That there in the background is Mike Yazel. He's a longtime friend of Tom Schiffer's. We've been talking here. Uh, you remember Nathaniel Logsdon? That he's gotten into this uh, vintage car camping, where they run around Model A's, Model T's, and and dress like uh, they're in the 1920s, and then camp and things, set up camps and and things. And and we've been talking down here of putting together an event, do it over on the primitive side. And bring in those cars. Do it like a the beginning of the NMLRA about that vintage, the twenties. Yeah. Set it up and have that car group come in. Have a chunk match where you're shooting an actual shingle and things, and just putting together kind of a vintage event that's just all eye candy, you know. Just kind of doing something just completely different than what people are used to seeing. Well, when I went up there to the uh, D-Day reenactment at Conneaut, which isn't all that far from you, is it? Well, yeah, it is. It's way across the state from you. Where, what town is it? Conneaut, in? Ohio. Okay. It's on Lake Erie as far east as you can get, okay. just about. Okay. I'm almost in the middle of the state. Yeah. Left that's and right, right. I'm yeah. about dead center. I'm right. I'm 10 miles east of the 31 corridor as it heads north, you know, there. So but you go up there and you see the German camp, would, uh, which would be as big as this area to the clubhouse and, and from the oh, playground to the firing line here. And it would be covered with German encampment. They'd have a Fallschirmer Jäger, which is a German paratrooper group, and they would have uh, 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 nurses, uh, all in full period dress, and they would have uh, guys running around in these BMW uh, motorcycles with a sidecar, and they, you know, the, the old coal scuttle helmets, and uh, uh, 
and they actually have a, uh, a German 88 there, and they shoot it. And I think they, seven pounds of the shot, lock, okay. and they do a, uh, an invasion. And my son's kind of in charge of the invasion crew, uh, which kind of scares me to death because they, they've got, they, Three landing boats, one's an amphib, and, and the other two are the uh, Higgins boats. And they actually load them up and take them out and then bring them in, and uh, they have the mock battle. Uh, Where'd they find all that stuff? God, it came back in barracks bags and <laughs> mess kits. <laughs> You know, you, my dad always said when he was a kid that, you know, later in life he became quite a uh, historian of the Civil War. And dad had a tremendous amount of history of books of the Civil War. And I have a photograph that he owned that got published in one of the Civil War books and things. And it was an unknown photo. It was a photograph of a regiment that that's, they believe to be the only photograph of that regiment that, that anybody knows about. And he uh, really got into the Civil War. And he said, yeah, he said, you know, he said, when I was a kid, I knew Civil War veterans. He said, there were half a dozen of them there in town I lived, grew up in over there in Atlanta Green. He said, I never had sense enough to talk to any of them. You know, but you don't, you know, dad was born in 25. And, well, you're just a kid. They ain't going to talk yeah. to me. Yeah. And he said, man, he said, the things I could have learned, you know, just asking questions but well you know uh, Miss uh, Funderburg do you know who she is who? Funderburg I don't think so. was her maiden name and she won the Crosley and the national championship here in 1959 or something I don't remember the dates all in here but uh, since she won both of them and was the only person I think that's ever won both at the same shoot, uh, I made it my business to try to find her and, uh, and I found her. Uh, her name is Robinson now and she came up here and visited me before the book came out. And she had photo albums that were compiled by her father. And he was a physician in Ohio. Uh, I don't know, up around uh, where Becky lives. Okay. And uh, when they were kids, uh, the, the, I think there's a, there was a son and a daughter uh, and the wife, uh, all had Claude Turner guns. Uh, he had the money to, to buy them anything they want, wanted. And uh, he had, according to her, a, uh, an extensive gun collection. And I says, well, did you inherit that or what? No, it was sold at Christie's. So it must have been a collection. And she came up here and visited me uh, three years ago, I guess it was. And she had all these pictures in the book. And that was a blind spot to me, research-wise, picture-wise, was color pictures of these grounds, which she had. And uh, I said, do you mind if I copy these? And I have my little camera in there, you know, when I'm doing this. And her husband says to me, she he says, uh, well, uh, which ones do you want? And I said, well, I, I don't know yet. But uh, he says, well, I'll... he had them copied commercially and sent them to me wouldn't take any money, 
and you know what that would cost, you know, <laughs> me doing that commercially. But anyway, she was she was a resource, and they camped beside the Last Chance Hotel. And I thought, oh boy, here's where I find out some stuff about the Last Chance Hotel. And I said, well, what what was it what was it like? Oh, my mother says you don't go near that place. <laughs> Oh, Lord. What's the, what's your number one reason why people need to, to buy the book? Entertainment. It's just good entertainment. If it isn't entertaining to you, I'll give you your money back. I mean, it's, it, it was hugely entertaining to me when I lived it, lived down here. I mean, I've been coming here uh, since 1954, 55, used to come over uh, on the Aurora Ferry uh, across the Ohio River. And uh, this was before uh, the divided highway up here was completed. And well, as a matter of fact, it was under construction at that time. But uh, that's why they should buy it. It, it, it. There's a lot of fun in here. Thank you very much, Tom. Really you are entirely it. welcome. You put a lot of work into this book, and we want to get it out there. Yeah, thank you. You can check out the book and even read some excerpts on our website. at the NMLRA, nmlra.org. Some more general housekeeping stuff, just as we've kind of picked up some steam here, which is really exciting. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, it was a little slow this month with December, but we've got a ton of stuff planned for January. We'll be setting up and talking with Mark Humphreys, who's the Black Powder Maniac Shooter on YouTube um, on New Year's Day. He's actually putting on a New Year's Day Woods Walk shoot at the Walter Klein Range at NMLRA headquarters. And then later in the month, I'm heading out to the SHOT Show to hang out and meet people there. I'm hoping to bring some muzzleloading themed coverage from that event. I know it's kind of a big black gun event, but we're really excited about the meetings and things that we have lined up to talk to some people out there about muzzleloading. So it's really exciting. Uh, look out for that in late January, probably early February, just depending on how hectic it is. Um, and a shout out too, we've had a recent uh, partnership here at the NMLRA with the guys over at Primitive Pursuit. They run an archery, a traditional archery themed podcast and website where they're working on promoting the traditional side of archery and just focusing on the real old school stick bow kind of stuff. And they're branching over into flintlocks, which is really exciting. Be sure to check them out at primitivepursuit.com. One last thing, we'd also like to thank the NMLRA membership for making this all possible. We couldn't do the podcast, the book, the website, the videos. Their membership goes directly to making all of this possible, so thank you guys very much. If you're interested in becoming an NMLRA member, you can find out everything you need to know at nmlra.org or um, hit me up on social media and I'll do whatever I can to answer some questions and um, help you out. So thank you very much.